here. Um, good evening, everyone. For those of you who are not here 10 seconds ago, I am not Carol Summerfield. My name is Alexandra Schneider, and I am the manager of public programs at the History Center. And I want to thank you all for joining us from the comfort of your living rooms and at least two time zones that I know of to be here for Modern in the Middle, a book talk with the lovely Susan Benjamin. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing Susan this evening, but before we get started, as per usual, I have a couple housekeeping announcements for you. One, for your viewing ease this evening, I recommend that you select the speaker view in the upper right-hand corner of your screen for Zoom if you haven't done so already. What this will do is just make sure that whomever is speaking appears much, much larger than everyone else. Um, everyone else will kind of be small up at the top of your screen, and that way when we have a large group, if Susan's talking, she doesn't get lost in the ether of all the other faces and you'll be able to see her as she speaks. Secondly, if at any point throughout the program you have a question, you can use the chat option at the bottom of your Zoom screen to send a question. Um, right now the default is to send it to everyone, so, but so that it doesn't pop up on everyone's screen, you can select from the drop down menu and select um, I guess Carol Summerfield will be the one to address it too, because that will be me. Um, and then at the end uh, for our Q&A session, I can go ahead and uh, moderate those for Susan to answer. But um, that sounds good. We'll go ahead and get started. So it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker um, this evening, Susan Benjamin. Susan is an architectural historian with over 40 years of experience in a broad variety of preservation activities. She, along with the members of her firm, Benjamin Historic Certifications, have written numerous local and national register landmark nominations for noteworthy Illinois buildings of all periods and styles, often so that owners can receive the tax benefits for rehabilitating their historic buildings. She frequently lectures on a wide variety of topics, from historic landscapes and residential architecture to the history of the shopping mall. Before completing Modern in the Middle with Michelangelo Sabatino, she and architect Stuart Cohen co-authored two books on Chicago area architecture, Great Houses of Chicago from 1871 to 1921, and North Shore Chicago, Houses of the Lakefront Suburbs, 1890 to 1940. However, Modern in the Middle is the book Susan says she has always wanted to write and has been researching since she assembled a traveling exhibit on modern architecture in Chicago for the 1976 bicentennial. So this is a project of passion for many, many years. She and her husband live in a mid-century house, and she's going to give us a little bit of a sneak peek at that building in her presentation. And she and her book partner, Michelangelo Sabatino, have been working together for the last three years, and they're both so pleased that their book is now out for you to enjoy. And with that, we're going to learn all about modern architecture in the middle. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Susan. Let me just go ahead and pull this up for everyone. Oh, great. And I will, I will cue you as we change slides. Sounds good. Is everyone seeing the presentation okay? Yes. Great. All okay. right. Terrific. Well, Hi, it's my pleasure to be here and to share with you the wonderful experience that I had writing this book. I think the fun of it is sharing it with people. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased. The goal was to really define and better understand what modern residential architecture is like in Chicago, in the Chicago area. And as we go through it, I think you'll see that uh, it, it's because Frank Lloyd Wright has a long history here, and because Mies van der Rohe came here in 1938 to, to be director of the architecture program at Armour Institute, that there is this architecture that is special and I think characteristic of Chicago. So, and we will talk early on about modern in the middle, because what a strange name for a book, right? But, so, next slide, please. Ah. Huh? <laughs> has it has it changed? I, I changed the slide. Did it not change for you? No. Um, Alex, you have Alex, you have to go to the um, presentation mode in the lower right corner. 
Okay, just a second here. This one right here. Ah. Yeah, and then click on presentation so the left stack of slides goes away. Okay, I'm just seeing the full presentation here. Hmm. It, this is what I want to talk about, so should I talk? Okay. Yes, you can keep going, sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Hey, you know, I, who knows what, what I will do it's, it, in <laughs> terms of technology. It's, every day is a new challenge. Um, I think one of the interesting things is we found these great houses throughout the Chicago metropolitan area so that to the north, it says the, the, uh, the William Ganster house. William Ganster was uh, an architect, William Pereira's partner, who went, he went on to, to be greatly successful in Los Angeles and designed the TB Sanitarium in, in, on Grand. And look at this absolutely wonderful house, a night view on a ravine in Waukegan. To the west, we found houses that are in Geneva, in Schaumburg, which was then Roselle, the Dorothy and Paul Schweiker house. And of course, these are architects' own homes. And, and frequently, the, the houses we select were indeed uh, architect, the homes of the architect, because they could, they, they were their own clients. They didn't have to kind of worry about pleasing somebody else. And the Lucille and Aaron Heimbach house in Blue Island, way to the south, and designed by Bertrand Goldberg, surprise, surprise, who designed Marina City. Next slide, please. How's it going? Did it change? No, not, not yet. And, and we're not seeing the right hand, right hand part of the slide. The right hand part of the slide. Okay. So the whole, there's a whole right strip that's, we can't see. Oh, Gwen, this is Andrew. If you cl uh, hover over the top of the bar on the right and um, click over the options, go to show active speaker and then the only Susan will show up in the top corner. Uh, but I'm seeing the slides on the left hand side of the screen. I know, I know that too. Yeah, you me. need to um, you need to change the presentation view. Okay. Up Thank to... you, Andrew. Got it. No, not you. Thank not you. So you. I was trying to say about the, the slideshow. Anyway. Yeah, Alex, it's it's still in preview mode where we can see the left slides. Okay. Um, Are me... you on two screens? No, I'm on one screen and I just I mean, I have escaped the PowerPoint and I just pressed it how I normally would to start a slideshow. Um, I can again try this. I can't do it, can I? It, I? I would know how if it were mine. If there's a little thing at the right hand corner and it just kind of fills the whole screen and that is okay. what you want. Right. Yeah. So enable editing. Alex, click on enable editing. Okay. Now go to there you go. Um, okay, so where you, where you got out of the um, share screen again, mm -hmm. and then go to the lower right corner and click on presentation mode. Um, after selecting power the PowerPoint. Yeah. Okay. Lower right hand corner, right here, presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Far right. It's the one on. Let's see. I can tell really quickly. Yep. There you go. Now, we've got presentation That's mode. That's it. You're on the right thing, at least of, of what I see. And now it will switch. No, it's still not. There. Oh, there right. you go. Now that works. it will switch, switch slides automatically when you click forward. OK, let me I, just test. I have to tell you, this feels like one big family. We're all <laughs> so, I, so yeah. if it were a potluck, we'd be good. Right. I so appreciate much. your patience with this. Um, OK, may I just, I'm just going to test going back really quickly. I just changed the slide and yeah. I move yep. forward to the map. Yep. Everyone see Perfect, that? Perfect, Alex. Yep. OK, yep. all right. Okay. Yay. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. OK, so why, why this strange title? Well, we were playing, I was playing with this title you know, years ago, Prairie Modern, Chicago Modern. And Michelangelo and I were at a lecture. Barry Bergdahl is a curator of, uh, at MoMA of architecture and uh, also teaches at Columbia. said, you know, modern in the middle. Hmm, clever idea. And we played with, with that. Okay, first reason, middle of the country. Where's Chicago in the heartland, right? Next. And who are the clients? This book is not about lifestyles of the rich and famous. They were pro progressive, middle class, upper middle class clients 
and progressive thinkers. And by the way, I want to show you the name of the houses of Fran and Van Rowe's house. This may be the first time in the history of the universe you will have seen a house named by both people who own it. The wife's name is, is seldom included. So that was a big deal to us. And if you think it didn't take time to track down some maiden names, it did. Anyway, so the clients were progressive people. Ben Rose, I happen to know Ben and Fran. He was a world-class fabric designer. This is his showroom at the Merchandise Mart. And he built, well, we're going to talk about his house later. But here are some examples of his work. And you can see these whimsical figures. And we'll talk more about that later. But he was a designer. Next. Another person whose house we featured in the book was Ralph Helstein, who, by the way, was a fraternity brother of my father's, which is just, you know, one degree of separation. But so he was a, he was a big deal. He was head of the Meat Packers Union for over 12 years. He marched with Martin Luther King, was a, his good friend. And who did he pick to design his house? Bertrand, was but Bertrand Goldberg. And Bud Goldberg cited this in uh, Hyde Park. You can see the neighborhood, which is made up of apartment houses. It's basically like a domino. You could, you could build up, you could build, you could build um, out. And in this universal space of, of concrete cylinders uh, supporting concrete slabs with a, kind of a glass skin behind it, you could do anything on the inside and you can see the, um, the, the, the balcony in, in the house. This is an extraordinary house. Next slide, please. Okay, it's an architectural middle ground. And that's what I referenced before. And I happen to love these photographs because Wright is, is Frank Lloyd Wright is in nature. And that's how you see him. And his houses are in nature, organically related to, to the environment where they are uh, located. And there you see Mies van der Rohe, who, whose structuralist approach to architecture is expressed in this very formal and a bit standoffish picture. But I, I think that it, these, this is important because I've been thinking about this for decades and the, it's the architectural middle ground that characterizes uh, residential architecture in this area. Next, please. So, uh, in the first real movement that influenced architecture in Chicago was, took place in Europe. And an exhibit was put together in 1932 at the Museum of Modern Art that defined mm -hmm. modern architecture uh, and the commonality of design that we, we at least initially, were, uh, initially were, was associated with, with modernism. And even though it only was up a couple of, of, of months, the catalog, which this is a later edition, but with, with the Villa Savoy in the cover, uh, lasted for decades and decades and decades uh, and was enormously influential. And the show happened to be um, in Chicago, a, a version of it at Sears downtown. So what is modernism as it was defined as the international style because there were houses all over the world that shared these characteristics. Architecture is volume, not mass. Windows weren't punched openings. They, they could be located anywhere. Not formal symmetry like you see in a colonial house, uh, but a regularity and a sense of proportion and scale that, that, that worked and took the place of symmetry. And avoidance of applied ornamentation so that the nature of the materials itself served as ornament and they were above all simple houses. Next, please. I had the, the enormous, these were, these, were, these are my bucket list houses. And I did a year ago, right now, I visited the Villa Savoy. And what's interesting about these is they are, they are characteristic of mod, European modernism. It's 1939, it's not, it's 1929. I, I couldn't correct the typo. But you would, you would never know what supports this house that you're seeing on the left by Le Corbusier. It has a scooped out interior courtyard and, and a, a, a ramps running through it. And the, it looks like it could have no support because the windows are just bands. Uh, the Tugendhat house by um, uh, Mies van der Rohe in the, in the Czech Republic 
um, the windows in these, this house are, were designed to be retractable, so they're totally open to the exterior. And Mises' house and the houses influenced by Mises may not have been embedded in nature, but they viewed nature very uh, with, with great vistas. Although that, that, that wall and back of glass in actuality is a winter garden, so that it, the, the interior, there is this interesting blur of interior and exterior spaces in, in this house. Next, please. Now, what's, this is the, the first couple houses in our book really initiate the international style as it was defined in Europe to the Chicago area. And there's a very interesting story about Henry Dubin. This was his own house. It was called the Battle Deck House because it was a uh, fireproof steel construction like a ship. But when he was going to Europe, um, Michael Stein, who was Gertrude Stein's brother, wrote a letter to, uh, to um, Henry, to Le Corbusier introducing his friend Henry Dubin. So he did indeed get to meet Le Corbusier who designed the, um, the Villa Savoy. Uh, and in terms of Mies van der Rohe, you know, it was, he came, had, it was, was going to come to Chicago and uh, in, introduce a, a kind of um, modernism that, that you'll see, it, it shows influences of the international style because he, he had been in Europe and, and had designed international style buildings during this period. Next style, please. Next slide, please, I should say. Anyway, this is the battle deck. <laughs> and you, you can see the bands of windows, the flat wall surfaces, and many of these houses had exterior terraces. So it, there were wonderful places to <coughs> enjoy the, the healthy surroundings. And this is indeed the back of, uh, of the battle deck house, which, which just looks like, a, a, it looks like cubist from the front and, and kind of a, a, just a, a modern, almost a modernist painting from, from the back. And on the interior, you can, you can see the same characteristics. It's very simple. Um, materials and very simple geometric shapes that characterize that characterize this house. Next slide, please. The Catherine and Walter Fisher house. This was this house was was designed by Howard Fisher for his brother in Winnetka. And if you'll notice on in the roof plan, and I really <laughs> want to include that, that it it is the whole roof is one big series of outdoor rooms. So there's a living porch and a, and a terrace and it's, it's pretty amazing. This house just sold and uh, the new owners are very excited to have it. Anytime we find an owner who's excited to buy one of these houses, it excites me. What's interesting about this house is to me, and this is the here's a living room. Again, no applied ornament, ornament cork floors, the bookcases are a characteristic feature because they're all about geometry. And this house had, had was painted red and green, um, just like the interior of the Bauhaus was. Um, but what's interesting to me architecturally is that it is European modern and yet look at it. It's the cross-shaped form that we associate with the prairie houses of Frank Lloyd Wright. And, uh, and it has a central core, except in this case, it's not the fireplaces there would be in a Wright house. It's, it's the circulation hall that extends from the, the basement up to, up to that wonderful roof terrace. Next slide, please. And in Lake Forest, there's the Robert and Rosalie Morse house that is, it's, 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 it's sort of art deco. So there is this merging of history because look at the front door. It's a very abstract, it's kind of a almost classical pattern. And yet you look at the interior with the steel windows and the tubular furniture. Oh. And, and it's this kind of wonderful, wonderful blend. Next slide, please. The other event that had a major influence in Chicago was the Century of Progress. And this is George Fred Keck's uh, House of Tomorrow. And it was at the Century of Progress that Keck defined his, um, his passive solar energy that he applied, that he used for 
many of his subsequent modern houses. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But it happened because this house is basically all glass. So when the workers were there, they they were it was like being in a greenhouse. They were so hot. So that Keck started to play with the ideas of what he could do to heat and cool houses without, um, you know, the experience of being too hot or too cold inside. And that large of that large door was to house an airplane. This was indeed the house of tomorrow. Next slide, please. At the century of progress, the there was it wasn't just the the house of tomorrow. It, there was a whole exhibit of houses, a home and industrial arts exhibit that featured modern materials. So it used well, like Masonite. The Masonite house was designed by Walter Frazier, a name, you know, Frazier and Raftery are names that, that you are familiar with in Lake Forest. Or, or traditional materials like brick used in, in new ways. And you can see the House of Tomorrow here and some of the other houses and the family resemblance they have to European modernism. Next slide, please. The, the Century of Progress was up for two years. And this house was built by Keck the, uh, the second year of the show. And it's all, as you can tell, steel and glass, like a big erector set kind of, but more sophisticated furniture inside. So that is the MR chair by Mies van der Rohe. And the, um, the, the shot at night is one I love a lot because it shows Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion car. And you could, at the show, you could go for a ride in the car for 10 cents, which would have been a, a lot of fun. Next slide, please. This is a house that really defined pot, uh, passive solar energy as used by George Fred Keck. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit, although the house is still exists on Wesley Road and, and Green Bay, but it has been totally altered. I, I think you need to see it as it originally looked. It was located on a site, Irma Kuppenheimer was, you know, her maiden name, Kuppenheimer Close is the company. It was, there was a house there previously. The landscape was by Jens Jensen. And on the, 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 the circular drive, and it's located up on a ridge, a, a, a hill. And it's like a ship almost in, in, its, in its form, but total privacy from the road with its concave uh, drive. On the other hand, at, and you notice the color, because color was a big part of the design of these modern homes. On the other side, the, the, the convex side, it's all glass. Next slide, please. This is a diagram that shows what, um, what George Fred Keck was dealing with. So when he, he had, his houses had broad overhangs, almost all the so, passive solar designed houses, so that when the sun is low in the winter, it floods the interior and, and provide great light and warmth. However, in the summer, that didn't happen when the sun, sun is higher in the sky and it's shown on the, on the terrace. The living room of the house was, was open on three sides and he had designed it with windows that retract, but it, 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 it cost factor, it never happened. There were no lamps in the house, so the pin, note the pin heel, pin hole lights in the ceiling. Mrs. Uh, Kahn had a, 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 an injury and it was hard for her to walk. She walked with a limp and so there was to be no, uh, no cords anywhere she would trip over. She also smoked, so they, were all, they didn't want that around either. So the, the chairs and the tables had built in ashtrays. And the furniture, except for this, this settee around the fireplace, was all movable. In really quite an incredible house and, and one that set the stage for what Frank, uh, Fred, uh, George Fred Keck was to do in the future. Next slide, please. This is Philip, uh, Philip Mayer's own house. It was in Lake Bluff. By the time I went looking for it and found it, it had been demolished and replaced by two houses, which to me is like a great tragedy because this is another wonderful house. The same international style flat roof, no applied ornament, glass brick to allow um, total privacy from the street. And yet the back of the house was, was um, all glass facing Lake Michigan. Now, Philip Mayer is, you don't associate him with this kind of architecture, but it was his own house. He could design whatever he wanted. And he was very avant-garde 
in his thinking and in relation to this house. On the other hand, we, we associate him with those fabulous apartment buildings at 1260 and 1301 North Astor, which are more traditional in, in form and art deco and, and, and very chic and uh, interesting to, the, to his clientele. Next slide, please. Um, you know uh, Margaret McCurry. She was um, uh, Stanley Tigerman's partner, and she grew up in in uh, the Beverly area of Chicago, which is much like uh, the suburbs, uh, Beverly Hills, it's called. And this house was published in the January 1938 American Home Magazine. Paul McCurry was an architect. He studied. Uh, at Armour Institute before Mies was there, 1935. Mies came in 1938. So he had a very formal Beaux-Arts training, but look, for his own home, he again designed, or his, his home and Irene's home, he designed this thoroughly international style modern house, except oh, no applied ornament, except for the, the uh, uh, decorative trim at, the, at the, the dental moldings at the top. I think what's interesting was it was, you know, he, he graduated school in, in the early 20s, but he couldn't get a job in the Depression. And yet he worked out of that sign you see in his front yard was advertising uh, him and his architecture. And you can see from this, the publication in, um, in the magazine, how really forward looking and modern the house is. He uh, taught because he couldn't get a job in the 30s. Many of the architects in Chicago did public housing, but he taught and then he went to work for Schmidt Garden Martin and worked there for the rest of his career. In 1955, he moved to Lake Forest where Margaret and, and her sister Marion grew up and they um, both became architects, which is, is pretty interesting, I think. Uh, you, what you see on the right is uh, is Paul McCurry giving the, the gold medal in 1916 to Mies van der Rohe. And of course, the AIA gold medal is the, the highest achievement of, uh, that the AIA has to offer. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, 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 we talked about European modernism and how prevalent that was in the early years and influential. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright practiced in Chicago and he developed the Prairie School. That, of course, is the Roby House and the, that reference at the top, you know, dating from 1909. And Frank Lloyd Wright was pretty amazing. And all the art, I maintain that all the architects subsequent to, you know, in the, by, in the, in the 30s, um, somehow reacted in, in one form or another to Wright's work. They didn't all buy into it. They, some thought it was old hat, but many of them were heavily influenced by Wright but not the right so much of the prairie school. He, he always wanted to do low, low cost housing and he developed a house he called his Usonian, the play on the word USA, of course. 1936, first Jacobs house in Madison, Wisconsin. This is a construction photo. Same year as he did Falling Water. He was also in that year uh, on the cover of Time Magazine. And I think this is hilarious because he is of course looking admirably uh, admiringly, I should say, at his the, this image of falling water, which he took great pride in. But he also did of of the Unisonian houses. Next slide, please. And this is this is a pilgrimage too for me. I went up to see the the house. Now, what you see that you relate to the Prairie House, or is a great horizontality echoing the the flat prairie landscape of the Midwest. Uh, and carport, because the show off the car, it was a big deal in 1936 to, to have a car. Flat slab roof, uh, and but a window wall at the back. This is the front, can't see what's going on in the inside, but at the back, you know, uh, open to, to, the, uh, to, to a beautiful uh, site in, in back. Um, it, it, functional, open plan, uh, where one, one area is a, is a um, uh, a work area, one area is a dining area, and this was a very sort of a modern idea, unlike the, you know, the houses that preceded it, which had a living room and a dining room and, and, dis and bedrooms and discrete areas, not cordoned off, you know, by, by slabs or, or break fronts, but, but they were discrete rooms. Next slide, please. 
And I think it's interesting to note that in, in 1936, when he designed the, um, uh, the first Usonian house, he was kind of persona non grata around here. And he had, he had done the Imperial Hotel. He'd gone to California and done some pretty amazing things. And he was 69 years old. So Wright had a, a knack for reinventing himself, and he did so brilliantly. Um, this is one of the two houses that he designed in the Chicago area that are Usonians. The Catherine and Lloyd Lewis house, which is a split level. It's funny to describe it that way, but it, it is. You know, integral, integrally, in, organically related to its site. It's on the Des Plaines River. And the horizontal boards, the, um, uh, the punctured overhangs, the flat roofs, and the universal space that that made made up the living living area. And if you notice the way he he defines the dining area, it's at the back, sort of the back of the slide, is the ceiling is lower. So he he very cleverly differentiates the space while creating a uh, universal space. Next slide, please. The only other usonian type house and he designed these usonians from 36 until his death in 1959 is in hampshire illinois and you can make an appointment and go see it it's fantastic it was a farmhouse and the couple who lives there uh or the family so that uh, uh, mrs petersdorf is the granddaughter of the muirheads we went out there and you can and it is what it is today it's a farm and um all of the characteristics you would expect of Frank Lloyd Wright with the broad overhangs, use of natural materials. And Mrs. Muirhead was bound and determined she wanted Wright and paid more, but that was kind of typical of, of what, what you found. And uh, this, the house was published in the Architectural Forum in 1939. I love, I love that we were able to include photographs, family photographs, and, and uh, I'm this isn't in this presentation, but when we, we published the uh, Stevenson house, um, I, I contacted Nancy Stevenson and she found a picture of the house with uh, Adlai and, and, uh, and Bobby Kennedy. So it's always fun to see how people live in their houses and we were fortunate to be able to see some of that. Next slide, please, please. And there are some houses that are Usonian in principle. There's one in Barrington Hills and one in uh, um, uh, Bannockburn, and, and they have the characteristics of a Usonian house, but on a, a larger scale, including the Glore house here in, in Lake Forest. And you can see the use of natural materials and how the house ex extends into the landscape and, and it is a real sense of shelter. And it's, it's a beautiful house. And I understand that it, it too just, just sold to very happy, happy owners. Next slide. I put the phone number down. Now, I don't do that usually because you can't go calling the people who live in their, their homes, but this is a house museum and it is extremely special. I should tell you that most of the photographs in the book, a, a high percentage by Hedrick Blessing, and we had uh, access to that archive. And it is, this is a house museum and I urge you to I feel like I'm doing an ad, but you can, you know, you can write down the phone number and give Todd a call and uh, go see it. It was, it was built by Paul Schweiker, 1936-37. Uh, You're looking at Paul. I could call him that, I guess, because I did know him. Um, it was his studio. And this is the vista as you approach the house. The, the studio and the house are two separate structures. And you could look through to the, this beautiful Franz Lip landscape. Next slide, please. He was a great admirer of Frank Lloyd Wright. He loved the way Wright handled natural materials. He loved the way he handled the overhang. And there is a huge flow of interior and exterior in this house. Note the, the brick floor and how it, it, it extends into the, the ex, out to the exterior. There's, this is a combination of sort of Japanese influence. He designed it on a napkin, drew it up on a napkin as he was coming back from Japan where he stayed at the, uh, at the hotel, the, the Imperial Hotel that Frank Lloyd Wright designed. And Frank Lloyd Wright always, he did in his prairie houses and he does in his Usonian houses. He moves you through space in a very clever way. 
So you empty, you enter it in a low space, and then it opens up into a much broader, higher one. And that's the case here. This this more intimate uh, entrance hall opens into um, the, the living room, which is one and a half stories, and this is a fantastic fireplace. And that vertical element you see at the back is a, a window separating the brick walls. Pretty, pretty wonderful house. I would urge you to go see it. Next slide, please. And he too thought through uh, solar uh, energy and created, this was their bedroom, uh, of Paul and Dorothy's. And uh, the, the color slide, of course, is the way it looks today. The house is intact. Um, it has this, it, the, where you're looking, the overhang faces south and, and does the same thing as it would in a Keck house. It's a real solar room. Next slide, please. And this was Paul Schweiker's drafting room. And you can see there were two separate structures. This had been added to a, a few times with a, 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 an office for Paul later. Next slide, please. The second owners, she was my friend, so I, I'm proud to say, and that's the two of us visiting her exhibit, were Martil and Alex Langsdorf. And Alex was a physicist, and he worked on the development of, uh, of um, atomic energy and with Enrico Fermi uh, at the Stagfield University of Chicago, under Stagfield, and created the uh, nuclear, uh, I can't think of what it's called now, but the, the energy that led to the atomic bomb. And then Alex and several other uh, of his colleagues went to uh, Truman to plead with him not to use the bomb incredible man and and his wife martiel is a world was a world-class artist and this was a retrospective of her work at the uh, at at fermi lab where where alex uh, argon where he worked and she was the designer of the the cover of the uh, doomsday clock that uh, was the cover of the bulletin of atomic scientists we were having lunch once and and martiel said to me all I'm going to be remembered for is that damn clock. But, you know, we, we, we live with it today and we pay attention to it. Next slide, please. The firm was uh, Schweiker and Elting and Winston Elting's partner lived in Lake Forest. And this house is in our book. There's a picture of the two of them uh, with uh, it's, it's uh, between Wesley Road and in, in Walden. And it's, you know, it's same kind of thing where, where there's privacy at the back and you, you can see this the wonderful uh, views to the, to the backyard that extend all, all of the way to Wesley. Next slide, please. You can see many of these houses were published, which is, I think, pretty neat. Um, the Philip Will's house uh, was Will, Perkins Wheeler and Will were known primarily for Crow Island School, which they designed with Saarinen. But this house, in a more urban setting in, in uh, northwest Evanston, was very much influenced by Wright with its horizontal boards and its uh, low-profile roof. And um, I just had coffee with the owner, and she is lovingly restoring it. And it had been had, had some tough times. But you see the corner windows. Uh, you know, windows aren't punched openings anymore. So it, it, it has, you can see its, its relation to, to Wright's work. Next slide, please. Um, the Ennis House was designed by William Decknatel. Now, interestingly enough, there are only a handful of Usonian houses here, but ha they had a tremendous influence. And not very many architects in the Chicago area actually studied Italian, but William Decknatel did. And this is a multi-level house. It was designed for a professor at Northwestern, a liter literature professor. And we're looking at the garden side. What's interesting about this house is you can see how it's this universal space where you, you, are, you kind of walk in and then you, you, you walk in toward the, um, the living area. But those windows were, were published in and of themselves in a, a, a journal because they opened to create one large opening and that was pretty unusual. And you can see the, the, the heavy emphasis on, on a, a fireplace as a, as a hearth in the home and how um, 
how important that it was symbolically on the exterior and the interior. And the exterior and the interior kind of blur on, on these houses. They're so intimately related to uh, their setting. This is on, uh, it's in Evanston Dempster and it is on the uh, Daniel Burnham's estate site. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, the, this is uh, Professor Ennis's study and it was designed so that the uh, students could come and meet with their professor without even entering the home. So it's a really lovely home built on, on multiple levels. Next slide, please. Oh, Decnatel, th this is uh, uh, Windway at, in Kohler, Wisconsin. Many of you may have been up to, by Sheboygan to the Kohler, um, uh, Kohler Resort. And you can, this, was the, this is probably the, the most significant house that um, Decnatel designed. And you can see the family re uh, re uh, resemblance to the Ennis house. And uh, it, uh, this was, um, Kohler Jr. was a governor of Wisconsin, but it's a pretty amazing house. And I look forward to seeing it someday, I never have. Next slide, please. I could talk a lot about this house because it was designed by a woman architect, which was no small deal in 1960. Women had a really tough time uh, designing buildings. And up until the 1970s, if you think about the women's movement in the 1970s, the Mary Tyler Moore show, and you know, women were beginning to have some influence on their own, but she was very successful before the 70s. And she designed this house for the Showblooms. Um, he, she was a chemist and he was a professor and they, you can, you can see all the writing and characteristic of the relationship of, of the exterior and the interior with terraces and, and uh, decks and flat roofs. And it had an interior, it had, has an interior atrium, hence the, the palm trees and was a, a much, much loved house. Um, Jean Wareheim uh, lived in Lombard in a cooperative housing development that Wayne and I went to see. And it is amazing. It's a really interesting field trip too, where she lived and her, her general contractor that she worked with lived a woman. And um, she designed many of the houses in that area. And it, it, the, she was a really good designer. And she loved building residences. It, I mean, there's a very, very, there's varying thought on, you know, should a woman always have to design houses, but a lot of women architects were really felt they, they developed intimate relationships with their clients and they, and they liked designing homes. And that I had a talk with Cindy Weiss about that. And that's what she said, how that is, it's always been enjoyable. And Cindy designed our kitchen. So it's, it's kind of nice to, to be able to have included Jean Wareheim, but there aren't many. I'm going to participate in, in a forum in March on women architecture and design. And I hope to do a little further research on this and talk about other, I know of one other woman architect that appeared, but not many. Next, please. Uh, the Dart House, Dart designed, William Dart, who's designed several houses in Lake Forest, um, lived in three different houses in, uh, in Barrington, Barrington Hills, where he built, this was his first home. It was really his first special home. He, I, I want to, if I can find, it had, uh, if I can find the quote, it's funny because he, he lived in a place he called um, Dirty Ida's and when he was at Yale. And so this was his opportunity to build, you know, their first home and the cool things in it. Like, I mean, you can see the, the, the vast expanses of glass that were characteristic of European, characteristic of European homes and the influences of Wright too. But this has an interior sandbox. The, you can see a little kid playing there and the, the, uh, uh, the porch is just off to the left in this, in this uh, photograph with a car porch showing off the, the car. Next slide, please. And it was pretty hard to get cars after World War II. What's interesting to me is if you look at the plan, open plan, living dining area, separated by a break front, all of the interior public spaces and even this master bedroom face out onto the terrace overlooking the landscape. And the terrace itself was really 
at an outdoor room. And you can see uh, the, the intimate relationship between the interior and the exterior and how important it was to their well-being. Next slide, please. Roy Binkley. I want to show you this house in Walden Lane because it recently sold. He was an enormously talented architect. And you know, what we have included in the book are houses by lesser knowns like Roy Binkley. And he, this is a, a very special house in Long Grove and house lesser known houses or buildings by prominent architects like, like Bud Goldberg. But um, this is, I, we were lucky to get these wonderful photographs from uh, Maggie and Roy Binkley's daughter. Next slide, please. Well, this is the iconic Farnsworth house that uh, has an exhibit now that you have to go see. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. But if you wonder why I have included this house in the lower left that Stanley Tigerman designed, it's all, it's in a way it's it's very disciplined and you can see that in the book um, but it is a weekend house as was the house for for dr farnsworth most of the houses in our book were not they were people's year-round homes and there's a picture in your right with with me sitting on the steps uh, while the house was under construction a good book called broken glass on edith farnsworth and um, i i really recommend it. it's good read Next, next slide, please. And here's what I love about this picture. And you can go out to the Farnsworth house today and see how, how Edith Farnsworth uh, included her own furniture in it. It's an amazing building. It's all about the relationship of the interior and the exterior, but a different kind. It floats it, it, it is in space and has this wonderful view of, of the river, which floods all the time. It's five feet above the river, which is what those posts are, but it's not enough. As you know, it has uh, flooded and that, that is an ongoing challenge. But this is the way a house was decorated. Next slide by her. Not with the furniture that you see on the bottom with the Mies van der Rohe couch and the, and the Bruneau chair. Uh, interesting though, the fireplace core is still a, the prominent feature in the house. She slept I mean, you know, it's interesting when you think about psychologically what it must have been like to spend the night there and, you know, read the book. It's, it, it, it's some interesting stories. They got into a legal battle, but it's, it's just, it's beyond that story. And you can see that's her sleeping in her bed in the, in the house. It's a fabulous place. Next slide. Um, the only other house, he Reese designed three houses in the United States the only other house in this area is the Isabel and Robert McCormick house. He was a real estate um, developer. He owned the land under 86880 Lakeshore Drive. But what he designed for them, for their, their weekend house, was this modular house. It, it, it could be built in sections and expanded or contracted as desired. So it was you know, it, it was his own kind of um, low income house, low, like the Usonian house. And that was how it was intended. The house has since been moved to be a, uh, in the bottom left corner, it shows you being a part of the Elmhurst Art Museum, which has a wonderful exhibit I have not yet seen called Right Before Lloyd. But look at the open plan on the inside, the children's area and the family living area, the children's area is then at the bottom by the kitchen and then the, the family area with the, and they bought the iconic pieces of uh, Mies furniture as they could. Next slide please. This house is going to be very familiar to you. Ben and Fran Rose. He's the guy I talked about who was the fabric designer and uh, Cypress and Steel House when you when you drive up to it and then he raced and owned antique cars, so he built this auto pavilion. James Spire was the architect. He became curator of, um, of, of modern art, I believe, at the Art Institute and in his later, later life, and design, you know, designed more exhibitions than he did houses. So in 20 years later, when they wanted an auto pavilion, they hired David Hayde, and David Hayde's house is also in our book. Next slide, please. 
This is the floor plan. One open space, of course, he designed these exquisite fabrics, and that those fabrics cordoned off the, uh, the dining area of the house. Um, uh, steel stairs opening up into the living area, which was all glass. One universal space with, with a, a wing that was, was small bedroom. Interesting, the fireplace co uh, core of the house. Fran said it never drew very well, so they never used it, but inter interesting design. House is a beautiful house. Next. This is what you're probably familiar with, the iconic movie for Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where his friend Cameron crashed a car through the, the back of the auto pavilion. And they collected these fabulous antique cars, which were sold off at Christie's. So I said to Fran, you know, how could you let them like put, you know, drive the car through the house? And I don't think the city of Highland Park would allow it today. She said it was very simple. They promised they'd wash the windows. So that was the, the, the true story that she told me. Anyway, that's the auto pavilion. New owner, uh, restore, repair, put in double glazing and did some things to make, make the house more livable. Next slide, please. And our last, one of the last images in the house is this wonderful home that John Vinci designed in 1975. And he was trained at IIT as a modernist. He's better known today as a preservationist, having, um, having you know, been instrumental in saving and restoring so many buildings. But this is in Riverside and the uh, major rooms are on the second floor with a studio and garages on the first floor, but really quite an exquisite modern house. Next slide. And finally, um, these are our houses. And about four years ago or so, uh, Michelangelo came to Chicago to take a position as uh, head of the uh, PhD program in architecture at uh, IIT. And he and his partner bought this house by Winston Elting, who designed the house, his own house I showed you in Lake Forest. And so he had the bug of modernism. And um, this was the house that he's been working, he and Serge have been working on for four years to, to restore. And uh, so we both kind of met because of his interest in modern houses. And actually, I should tell you this because uh, Kathy Govis, who used to own the, the grill in, in Lake Forest, uh, decided that we should meet each other. That's kind of how we got together. And she, um, she said, you need to meet Michelangelo. And she met Michelangelo because he lives in an Elting house. And she lives in Elting's house. And he called me and that's how we started to be friends. And then he said, would you like a partner working on your book? And I said, that would be fun. So, you know, that's what happened. Next slide. Okay, this is the way I live. And uh, we've lived in our house for, since 1973. And uh, I would like to tell you, I take great joy in restoring it right now. I'm glad we've done all the work we've done, but I'm glad I, that we only have to do some repairs like chimney tuck pointing. Um, Bill Zabarin took this wonderful photo of our house. We love living here. You can see the prairie influence. It's kind of a transitional house because it has a more traditional form you know, it's, it's a box with a wing and it has a gable roof, but it has corner windows and bands of windows. And it really is kind of all about geometry on the interior as well as, as the exterior. And then in the back, uh, 1966, uh, a room was added, they call a Florida room. So you're, that, the picture on your lower right is uh, the Florida room looking out in our backyard. And uh, so in essence, the back of our house is glass too, and it's really kind of fun. We knew Larry Perkins who designed our house, and it was fun knowing him. He and Midge used to come over and we'd have a glass of wine and, and play Bach and, and uh, enjoy each other's company. And it gave us enormous pleasure that he took pleasure in our home and, and wanted to come over and, and spend time with us. So it's, it's kind of a love affair with modern houses that uh, brought me to this book and then to my client as a partner. Next slide. I guess that's it. Um, but it was fun to do. 
and uh, fun to share. And I hope you enjoyed our sort of journey through Chicagoland, uh, looking at modern in the middle. I see people I know. This is fun. Thank you. That was wonderful, Susan. Let me um, see if we have some questions here. I wish I could be with you all. That's the <laughs> tough part. So I see. Um, so to cut down on some of the feedback during the program, I muted some of you. But if you have um, questions, we can do that now. We have one chat question, which was in regards to why was he persona non grata? Um, but if we can have maybe a little bit more specifics about who that was in reference to. Oh, I don't remember. It was uh, right. No. Oh, I don't think. I, I, well, I think that was in reference to Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah, you say okay, he was. I, I can talk about their relationship. I didn't do it so much. I think they had enormous respect for each other, but Wright was this big showman, you know? And so he, do you want me to tell you a little bit about them and their relationship? Is that interesting to people? He, there were some architects who, well, let me tell you that, and then I'll, t I'll, I'll get to your question specifically, Laura. Um, he, uh, Mies van der Rohe came to Illinois in 1937 on a visit, on his way to design a house in, in, the, in the West. And he wanted to see Wright. Wright said to him, oh, sure, bring him up. Now, I have to tell you, he turned down Gropius, he turned down Le Corbusier. So the fact that he invited Mies to, to be there, to come up to Taliesin, was pretty neat. So instead of a day, he didn't even have an adequate change of clothes, Mies spent four days with him. And then on the way back, he they stopped at Johnson's Wax so he could look at uh, the construction of, of that those buildings. So, I mean, I th then when Mies finally came to, to move to Chicago to head up the IIT uh, Department of Architecture, um, he Wright was chosen to um, uh, introduce him at the introductory banquet, and um, he said, "I want you to meet Mies. You'd be you'd be wonderful to him. He's my friend, and he's my Mies." Well, and then he swooped out in his cape, you know. So there was there was this kind of funny relationship. I always thought it was good that that Mies didn't speak much English because it would have been kind of an appalling situation, but. Um, but there was there was mutual respect, and I've read enough oral histories to kind of know about that. Um, they didn't buy into each other's, and this is where I'm going with this. They didn't buy into each other's aesthetic, but they they respected each other. So all these people that were influenced or impacted by Wright and by Mies had different attitudes. But like Harry Weiss said, you know. We would when Mies was the new kid in town. He was the he brought the European ideas and he was enormously respected. We just we we would sit at his feet like a Buddha. This is from Harry Weiss's oral history, and we respected him so much. And Frank Lloyd Wright was yesterday's news, so that's the kind of thing I mean. That he it wasn't that he was. You're going to hear arguments about this, and and we're going we're going to I'm going to participate in a program on it. That. Um, I'm not convinced that it was Wright versus Mies. I think there was an awful lot of synergy and a lot of influence on both of them and on many of these houses. So you see both going on. Um, but but in terms of influence, the, the newer ideas, which ironically weren't so new because they were from Europe in the 20s, um, that was that was what Mies van was about. And Wright, he, he was, okay, he was, 69 and 36, so he was 72 and 39 when he did that Usonian house on the river, and and then in 51, I can't do the math, but he was a lot older. So, you know, it was, that was what, I don't think he was persona non grata. I think he, he just wasn't what was new and exciting and interesting, and, and, and so people, he'd been around a long time. That didn't, I don't think that made him any less interesting or influential 
or talented or anything. It's just that he was yesterday's news to some people. That was a long answer. Well, a good answer. A good one, though. Thank you very much for that. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, I see more. I, you know, it's so funny. I like I know how to do this. I just see four. Okay, what what's happening next? So, um, Jean Sylvester would like to know: Were there houses that you couldn't include in your book, and if so, are there plans for a sequel or a second book? <laughs> That's a very interesting question. There were that was there were numerous houses we couldn't include, and the, for a variety of reasons. First of all. I really wanted Edward Humrick in this book. I really wanted Tony Grunsfeld in this book. Okay, so we couldn't because I couldn't get photographs of Humrick houses. I, I, I mean, we visited, we, I, you know, we have, this book is largely 80% 80, 80 at least of um, archival historic photos by Hedrick Blessing or, or from um, the Art Institute collection, you know, so that was a problem. Couldn't get any of Tony's records because his, they weren't at the office. His son had taken him. So that was a problem. But the, the bigger problem is we couldn't create the Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, I mean, we had to limit ourselves to, and, and I don't want people to think that these are the only houses because they're, I mean, they're fabulous modern houses. If anybody wants, Don Robleski's house is going on the market next week. You want a beautiful modern house in Bannockburn? Whoa, I'm telling you, it's, it's a treat. But there are, there are many more. And as you drive around, you're going you're gonna to find more. You're going to find them in Lake Forest. You're going to find them Olympia Fields. I mean, I, it, this has been such a treat learning about them, but there are many more, many more. A sequel? Whoa, I don't know. It's, okay. <laughs> it's, I'll tell you something, sidebar, it's hard to publish a book. It's hard, it's expensive to publish a book, you know, and so actually getting it off the ground is like a big deal. And I'm hopeful that this will be the beginning of further research and further writing. Um, we'll see what happens. I, I don't know. I, I write, I take one step at a time. Well, Lisa Temkin added that she has a homework friend in Lake Forest, so you two can connect if there's a next book for that. She has a, I'm sorry, I didn't hear Lisa. What? A, a, what? Uh, a, a homework friend? Did I pronounce that correctly? Oh, hey, Edward Humrick? Humrick, yes. Yeah. Field trip, Susan. Pardon? Field trip. Field trip. <laughs> no. I'm game, you know that. Why now? Yep. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Um, we have another question. So uh, Rami Lopat um, yep. says, thank this you, Susan. So You're a to totally enjoyable speaker, especially because your personal interest is so obvious. Well done. Where is the easiest place to buy your book? So we have a question about the practicalities of the book. Um, and then is Peter Roche in the book at all? Kevin, Peter, oh, Hammond and Roche, right? Rami, I think. Um, I think you can buy our, I, I'd like to think the Lake Forest Bookstore has it. I don't know. Um, I hope so, because I like to support small bookstores. You can order it on Faden.com. Monticelli was bought out by Faden in the middle of our, our travels here through modernism. Um, you can buy it on Amazon. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty easy to get, you know, to, to purchase. No, we don't. You know, I'm telling you, there's so many people that it, 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 it's sad that we couldn't include people that who are very talented and um, didn't happen. Yep. Oh my gosh, eight. <laughs> um, as a follow up to that, can you talk yeah. a little bit more about the geography of the houses? Are they mostly in the southern suburbs, northern suburbs? What town sort of has the highest concentration of those? Well, if you want to see Keck houses, River Woods, interestingly, uh, Olympia Fields, Flossmoor on the long, you know, a, a, a bit of a ride from Lake Forest, but has some beautiful houses, including Humrick, oh, and, and um, the South Side. You know, they're kind of, when you mention that concentration, you don't find that really. 
they're scattered, you know. Um, they're on side lots sometimes in older suburbs, like Highland, there are a few in Highland Park. And, and we were looking for geographic diversity, but that's how they played out, you know, that they're, they happen to be. I mean, the houses in Waukegan, the house in Waukegan, the Ganster house, is, um, it's in a development. There are a couple of other modern houses next to it. It's in the north, north side of Waukegan. Fantastic. You know, um, they're scattered. I, I, I think a trip to curious places like this Lombard area development has some really good houses. But you know what we're not talking about either, and maybe we need to as part of the story, is these houses, there's like, there, there are, where there are concentrations of modernist houses, they're in development sometimes in Highland Park, Stonegate, Glencoe. I, oh, I know. In Glencoe, there's a, the, the uh, ravine. No. I'd have to call me or something and email me, and I'll tell you the location. But there's a concentration of many Keck houses, a development it's by Harold Court. Carol Court, isn't that what it's called? Or Carol Lane? It is Carol Lane and Carol Court off Green Bay Road. Um, and, and that's a wonderful, that's a great area to see Keck houses. But everywhere else, I think they're kind of scattered about. Great, thanks. Let's see, there's a couple more popping up, um, along with a huge wealth of compliments about your book and your presentation, Susan, just FYI. Um, let's see, I imagine your book will connect owners to each other, but is or was there an existing organization that brought owners of these homes together? Yes, yes. And it's, it is gone dormant. It is Chicago Bauhaus and Beyond, if you go online and look at everything is out there, there for, it was in existence 10 years. I was going to show you, I can't show you, or maybe I can. Where's my book? Oh, here, I'm going to, I hope everything doesn't come falling down. But the first book on modernism, can you see this? Okay. It was, this was done 10 years ago by Joan and Gary Gand, who have a Keck house in uh, Riverwoods. And they've moved to Palm Springs, you know, where, where there are many, there are concentrations, plural, of incredible modern houses. And so Joan and Gary started the Chicago Bauhaus and Beyond organization 10 years ago. They were marvelous tours and they were uh, all over the Chicago area, whether it was Flossmoor or um, Barrington Hills. And I think that going online and looking to see where those programs were held, I don't know what's there in the way of addresses, but you're gonna see lists of really incredible houses. And so that was the organization, but it, it kind of doesn't exist anymore. Um, it, you know, Joan and Gary were organizing it and, and there were other people and they're just, you know, they, well, somebody moved to Hawaii and they moved to Palm Springs and I wish it existed. I mean, Landmarks, Illinois is, are, you know, big supporters of preserving these houses, but it's not like it was where we could go on tours. It was fun. Uh, Sharon would like to know, are there many postmodern houses in the area? Whoa. Well, I don't, I assume it's sold. The answer is no, because that the movement itself was a little peculiar. But by peculiar, I mean, mod, there's a certain elegance to modern houses. I mean, you know, they're simple, they're straightforward, they're nice to live in, you know, postmodern houses are quirky. And the one house that is fantastic that, that Stanley Tigerman designed on Park West in Highland Park is amazing. It would be very hard, hard to live in it because it is so, um, it has such strong personality. I don't know how else to put it, but you know, it, modern houses are kind of neutral and you can kind of impose the way you live and the way you, your style on it. Postmodern is hard, but that house, it's kind of modern, modeled after a shtetl in Eastern Europe. And so it, it has made up of pavilions. It's fabulous, it's fabulous. It was on the market. I have no idea if it's sold, 
but you can go see it and just seeing it from the outside is pretty pretty special it's wonderful but not i can't if you ask me name another one not so much the reaction against modernism was less postmodern than it was traditional so you see that it swung over to some interpretation of historic houses i said some because they're not very literal they're just interpreted by whoever happened to be building them and designing them and some are better than others great um i had a question i noticed that a lot a lot of the mid-century homes not all of them um yours included um yours has gables but a lot of them are flat roofed how does this may be a very again west coast question but the midwest with all of its snow accumulation what how did the flat roofs kind of deal with the extreme weather in the area I suppose they leak. <laughs> well, I'm I'm only being half funny because like Don Wobleski's house, I mean, you kind of have to replace the roof. It's going to be priced quite affordable. So putting in that extra money to fix the roof is okay. But you know, today they have modern materials that are not going to leak, I think. I'm no architect, you know that. But um, I think it would be wiser to have one today. We got we have a flat roof on our garage and it's about 15 years old and we've never had any problem with it. You have to get the snow off, but you know. Oh, um just an aside that has not to do with snow, but uh Keck's house is cooled, speaking of leaking, cooled by holding a film of water at the top that would evaporate and cool the interior. I mean, to me, that's like living under a river. So I'm not sure that that would be my choice because it's scary. And uh, Chris Ank, who's restoring the Fagan house, and that's another house going to be, when he's done, going to be out there to buy. And it's fantastic by Keck and Keck. You know, he's putting in air conditioning and it's not going to have a film of water at the top. It's a more realistic way of living. I think it's a problem. But I would love to hear somebody like Stuart Cohen or... Tom Rakovich or, you know, all our friends, architect friends, address it, not me. Um, any other questions from anyone? If you want to unmute yourselves and ask or put it in the chat, um, you're welcome to do so. You know, I can, I, I can even, oh my, I'm sorry. I'm sounding like such a newbie. It's only because I am. So there are all these, I see on the chat, there's a lot of questions but Vicki oh no oh, I just see their comments so much you have a lot of a lot of very positive positive feedback um, well in that case just thank you thank you all so much and Susan thank you again for a really wonderful presentation um, fun for me good good I'm so glad and thank you all for tuning in um, and, uh, you know, we try to continue to bring these programs to you uh, free of charge, but if you have been, enjoyed the presentation and you are so inclined, we always welcome, you know, a small donation so that we can continue to make this content available for you all. But thank you all again so much for, for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Really well done. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, as they say. <laughs> it's great to see you and hear you. Oh, hi. Great to see you, too. Wonderful job, Susan. I, I highly recommend her book. It's beautiful. You won't be disappointed. Yes, it's delicious to read. Thank you. Thanks so much. Looking forward to it. Good night. <laughs>
certainly different. It is, it is different. I see we just have Nancy on. Nancy, are you still there? Nancy? And yeah, one of, um, I think she may have left, may have left the room. Um, so we'll just, I think, I think this worked um, well. I'm, I apologize for the screen sharing issue. I did what we did at our practice and it didn't, didn't want to work, of course, but. You know, I, I thought it was just fine. And, you know, we all, who knows, you know, we do the best we can. And sometimes it's more challenging than other times. I am terrified. I am doing something with, <laughs> I am. I mean, I, I talked to him today with some kind of technology where you, it, it's like, it's, it's like a, a, a something, the 3D and it moves through the house and you narrate, but you have to do it afterwards. I don't know. We'll see. Well, I think this worked really well um, once we got past the little glitches at the beginning. So thank you so much again. It was my pleasure. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you. And by the way, thank you for making it easy for me because you, you knew I was nervous. You know. I, I mean, we both were, but I wanted to make it as easy for you as possible. <laughs> well, you're very nice. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, Susan. Take care. You too. See you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. I hope so too.